I wanted to share my recording process with you today. So when I work with a new artist, I send out this document that kind of outlays the process and everything that they can expect. And I always get really positive feedback from that because it just does lay out the process and then it relaxes the artist because they know what they can expect from the studio, they know what their role is, and they have a clearer picture of what the end result will be. So I thought that'd be a great thing to share with you so that you can have that same sort of peace of mind maybe if you're a bit worried about recording or if you've recorded before just to understand my process and how it all kind of works. There's a lot the engineer is doing um, with the artist not in the room. I know I've, I spend the bulk of my time working on a project without the artist in the room. So I'm going to let you know what I do to get my recordings happening all the way from pre-production through to the mastering stage. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm Craig from the Dot of Date Studio. We're talking about going from musician to artist, and today I'm chatting about the recording process. So, a good artist, a good music artist, needs a good recording as a representation of themselves. Obviously, we want to be putting that on Spotify and growing followers from our recorded music. But before we get to that recorded music, we've got to do the recording process, and that is a little bit grey for a lot of people. So, that is what I'm going to chat about today, and we're going to start with pre-production. So, I've got five stages that I think the recording goes through that I work through anyway Um, pre-production then tracking or recording editing mixing and then mastering and uh, I think they're all equally important you obviously can't miss any of those steps or you can miss the steps but obviously is better with it so let me chat about that I'm going to start with pre-production so this is skipped a lot of the time and it, uh, it really affects the end result it definitely affects the process when you skip pre-production so for me Pre-production is just getting the song ready. So you've written a song, you want to take that to the studio, but there might be a few tweaks that you can make to just elevate the song, uh, both from a recording perspective to make it easier to record, and secondly, from an audience perspective to make it easier to consume. So often if a band plays all the time, they've never heard it back before, when we do pre-production, we kind of record a rough demo of it. So if it's a band, I'll get them all in the studio and just play the song how they have it and record that at a really basic level, just with a few mics around the room. And then they can listen back to that. And almost nine times out of 10, they'll go, oh, what are you playing during that bit? Oh, I thought you were, you know, the bass player's following the drums, should be following the guitar, or the guitarist is doing a different rhythm or something. So when the band kind of stands back and listen to it, they go, oh, we can actually make this heaps better. How about you play it like that? Or whatever. So that's kind of what I do with pre-production. And I've figured out through um through a lot of mistakes that that just works way better than actually recording the parts and then trying to edit them to be correct so it just it's so much easier to just do that before you start recording um in a singer songwriter situation um same thing they've they've just played it through so they can we can record it then as a demo and then as they listen to it um we can kind of discuss together what if your chorus came in a bit earlier what if we um it's quite a long chorus, so let's just use half of it the first time and then use the full thing the second time. Or maybe your introduction is a bit long or maybe this chord would work better to lead into the chorus. That sort of thing. We can kind of just unpack the song a bit and then put it back together to a place that it's ready to record. That way when we set up the microphones and we start going, we're recording something that we know is going to work and it's going to sound good. So that's kind of what I do with pre-production. Typically it's only about one or two hours depending on the song. Um, or it's probably longer than that if you're doing an album but yeah just getting the band in breaking the ice with them listening to the song figuring out how we can best record this and make it happen it also helps me to kind of plan out the recording process so at that point I can go all right this song needs a bit of space the verse needs to be a bit more open the chorus needs to be really powerful so when I go to mic up those instruments during the recording stage the tracking stage I know sort of what sound I'm going for because I've been able to step back and have a holistic view of the song and how it should be sitting at the end of the day because um, my role as a producer I guess is to kind of imagine it so before the band hears it physically I have to kind of hear it in my head and then steer it towards that so pre-production is an awesome way to do that I'll also use this time to really get inside the artist's head as much as I can figure out what they want from the song what's their vision what other sort of music are they listening to and kind of figure out where they're wanting to go with the song and who they want listening to it is it going to be in playlists on the radio Uh, They're just trying to get more gigs out of it. If I can get inside their head a bit, then I can approach a recording with that in mind. And that's a much easier way to get to the desired result where then 
everybody's happy. So tracking the recording, this is the bit that uh, most people know about. It's the kind of thing we think about when we're recording is the recording part of it. But basically I, I call it tracking because that kind of makes it a bit different from recording, which is the whole process. So tracking is when we're in the room making it happen. That's when we're playing through the parts and actually recording the the sound. So I've got a live room there where most of the microphones are situated, if that's doing drums or acoustic guitar or vocals, but we've got that pre-production demo sorted out. So that's normally to click. Uh, we've figured out the BPM and the key. We figured all that out during the pre-production session. So now we can play that back and they'll basically layer over the top of it. So there's a few ways you can go about uh, recording and that is either to a click track or free time. So uh, I love click track. I'll always push people towards click track if I can because it just means editing is easier. It means layering sounds is easier. It kind of is more consumable, I think, when it, it feels normal and reliable. Um, there are obviously genres and occasions where you just need that flexibility in the time. And when you try and stick those sort of songs on a click track, it really ruins them. But generally, if it's just a, a pop song or a rock song or metal or something where you're wanting to kind of have a consumable song, click track usually works great. And if there's parts that need to slow down or move, you can map that in on a click track. So if, you, if it slows down towards the end of the chorus, you can map that in so the click track actually slows down. Um, and then you're in time and it sounds great. That way down the track, if you wanted to add a little bit of percussion to it, or if you wanted to put some delay on it in the mix stage, that's all timed and you can sync that to the click track as well. Um, you can set your reverb times and all those sorts of things to the time of the song. So I love recording to a click track, but sometimes it doesn't work. And often if you've got a full band in the room all playing together, maybe the drummer is the click track and they're all following him and that's fine. So I'll either decide, and again, this is all decided in pre-production so we know what's going on, but they'll either be playing along to a click track or they'll be playing along to the demo that we recorded during the pre-production. So there's two real ways you can do it. You can do it live or you can do it completely multi-tracked or you can do a hybrid of the two, which is what I tend to go for. So sometimes you'll just uh, get the strongest band, strongest band member um, to play the song through so that might be the guitarist might be the drummer might be the bass player to play it's usually the guitarist though to play the song to the click track or to the demo so they'll lay down their bit first and then everyone else will stack on top of it so then we'll do the drums then we'll do the bass and we do it all individually um, multi-tracking is a cool way to do it because you can focus on the sounds and the parts so for example if you're doing it all together you're all in a room You've got cymbals getting into the guitar mics, into the vocal mic. You've got bass notes getting into the guitars and everything's just flying around everywhere, which kind of does create this sort of magic sound. Um, it just, there's something about the sound of just the whole band in, but it does limit the amount of control you've got over those sounds. So if I want to turn some brightness up on the guitar amp, for example, I'm just getting brighter cymbals that are in that guitar amp um, or the other major thing is if somebody makes one mistake, so the bass player might hit one wrong note, you got a three minute song and he does one second on a wrong note, you can re you can fix up that bass, but if it's in the drum mics and the guitar mics, it's in the recording. So if you're playing live, it really um, means that all of you need to absolutely nail the song from start to finish the whole way through. If you're multi-tracking, if the bass player stuff's up, then only the bass player has to redo that part or maybe even just if you if you're recording to click and you're multi-tracking then you only really need to redo that section so there's two ways to do it and i'm i'm not for or against either it depends on the sound um, there's bands that come in that just sound way better if they're all in the same room with no click track but for kind of that more commercial consumable sound generally a multi-tracked click track version will be the best but again we always figure this out in pre-production we figure out how we're going to attack it. So they might do overdub, say the guitarist does his guitar part, but then he's going to do a solo or something. So he'll do that over the original guitar part. So there's a rhythm part and a lead, even though live you might only have one guitar, or you might um, layer up a double track of that, or you might add a tambourine or some percussion. So you're kind of, you've got the guts of the song that you can play and then you'll add extra parts. So if you're a singer songwriter, this is what's happening the entire time. So you've got your acoustic guitar or your piano and the rest of it, we're just layering up sounds. You might add a keyboard on, 
add a drum kit on, add a bass and just overdub to make the the song. So that might be with a session band or that might just be here. I play a lot of the instruments and I'll work with you to kind of figure out stuff and we'll get some other musos in if we need it. Uh, but we, yeah, we're overdubbing. We're just layering the sound on top of each other. In a band scenario, you're overdubbing if you want extra stuff other than what you can actually physically play at one time. So recording vocals is usually the most important part, I think. It's usually the hardest part to hear your vocals back. Like you, when you play guitar, you know what your amp sounds like. Play drums, you know what your drum kit sounds like. When you are singing, when you're the vocalist, you have this internal sound that is very different to the external sound. So it can take a while um, with singing to kind of get your head around what it actually sounds like compared to what you always thought it sounded like. So we can spend a lot more time on the vocals. And there's also um, pronunciation of words. You don't realize you're saying words a bit funny or maybe you're slurring two words together and you need a bit of diction. So it's usually a fair bit of time doing overdubs with the vocals. And normally what I do is get them to sing it through a couple of times just as a cider, a cider, cider, just as a cider to kind of feel the song out, have a bit of a practice and a warm up. And then we might do the verse, first verse, and then the second verse, because the first verse, and the, they might have a similar sort of vibe, but then your chorus might be like a lot more energetic. So we'll do both the verses while they're in the same vibe. Then we might do all the choruses. Then your bridge might be either massive or really small, so we can kind of hone in on those separately. Um, you might have uh, a really high note somewhere where you want to save that to the end so you don't ruin your voice trying to smack that note. Um, and I'll always try and get, I like having three complete takes that the artist is happy with for the vocals so that sometimes in the moment sounds fine you listen back the next day and you're going oh man I wish we got that word a bit better or I wish we got that note a bit better so I always get three takes that we're happy with and then I can always just go oh I'll just use the other take and the other thing I can do with that is then layer them up so when we get to a big chorus and we've got three uh, lots of vocal lines I can put all those in mix the other two quieter but you get a nice, big, powerful sound. So I'll do that with the guitars as well. Kind of layer it up and get some overdubs, layers, just to kind of help me later in the mix. So that's the recording part. The next part is the editing. And this is the unsung hero of a good recording. It's the part that nobody sees. Um, the band leaves and then the next time they hear it, it sounds amazing and they think that they are amazing, but the editing's amazing. No, they're usually amazing, but the editing makes a big difference. So what I'll do, what I mean with editing is I'll choose the take. So like I said, if I've got three vocal takes, I'll go through and choose which line is the best. So maybe they sung it three times, but in the end, it's going to sound like they sang it one time, just super, super well. So I'll pick the take, same with uh, drummers, maybe some fills are better than others, um, guitars, some chords are cleaner than others. So I'll go through and pick the best takes and kind of move those around so it sounds like one really great take. Next thing I might do is make doubles. So if we've got three vocal lines, I can pick the best one and then I can pick the second best one to be a doubled vocal, which I can then blend into the mix. Same with guitars. Um, if they're doing a nice big riff or something or some big chords, I can grab the some other takes. Like maybe I can grab the second chorus and layer that over the first chorus to make a double of that to make it a bit bigger. So I'm kind of like expanding what we record and just kind of getting the best out of everything that we recorded into one sort of sound. The next thing I might do is correct timings. So um, it's pretty easy to edit drums because they're so um, transient. How can I say it? There's such a big peak on it that you can kind of just cut it before the peak and move that around and it sounds, it's really hard to hear the edits in that. So I'll usually go through and fix up the drums and make sure they they sound really good and there's not any late snares or early kicks or anything because that can kind of throw your groove off a little bit. So I'll muck around with timings, um, sometimes on guitar as well. If the second chorus was just played a lot more uh, in the pocket, in the groove, then the first chorus, I might be able to take that there. I might be able to stretch some time out. Just edit it and make it sound good. Um, timing wise. So it's always in the groove. You know, you know, have you listened to those recordings where it's not quite timed and every time it comes in, you're like, Ooh, and it kind of just throws you off a bit. So I want to make sure that's not happening. And it's just super hard to play it perfectly. When you play it live, it's fine. If you're a bit out of time, you just move on. Nobody remembers it. But when you've got to listen to it over and over again and something's wrong, you can notice it, you can hear it. So I want to fix up the timings and make sure that the groove is really solid. And then I want to be doing the same thing with pitch. So auto-tune is the enemy, but it's really your best friend. So uh, you just hear when it's slightly off. So um, 
you can be you can be on an A, but if you're just under an A or just over an A, which you are 90% of the time as a singer, just off, it's very rare that you bang on. You can just hear that and it can be a little bit irritating. It's a little bit a little bit jarring when it's just off. So I use auto-tune on pretty much every single singer that I've worked with. I've, I've, there's only been one occasion where I've recorded someone and I opened up and went, I don't need to touch anything. This is absolutely brilliant. So there's a bit of wriggle room and I don't obviously make it um, sound like T-Pain. You can really straighten it out so it's bang on and sounds ridiculous. So you've got to keep it sounding natural, but it just means maybe just moving a note here or there. Again, just so you can listen to it over and over and it sounds really good. It sounds great. So um, I'm not saying singers can't do it. And if you don't want auto-tune, then don't auto-tune it. But generally, I will chuck a bit on it just to clean it up and make it unnoticeable. That's the goal, I think. So nothing's distracting. So it just sounds good. So I'm not talking about fixing up bad singers and making them sound like good singers. I'm talking about just fine-tuning good singers so their take just sounds great and then their story and their emotion of the song can come across without the distraction of being a tiny little bit sharp or a tiny little bit flat on certain notes throughout the song. I'll then go through and remove any noises. So because the microphones are super sensitive, vocals, for example, will have like all the time just before they're like as they're opening their mouth for the note. And uh, there might also be little guitar hits or um, drummers picking up the sticks or whatever before at the start or the end of takes or during quiet bits. So I'll go through and just take out all the noises that aren't actually part of the song. Because again, same thing, they can just be a bit distracting when you're, when you're trying to get into the emotion of the song and you've got little noises and bits and pieces. So I'll go through and edit all those out, just literally delete them from the track. And then the last thing I'll do is just normalizing. So... Sometimes you'll have like a really loud bit and a really quiet bit. So when I get to the mix stage, I want them to be all even so that I'm not having to have some faders right at the top because it's a quiet sound and some faders really, really low because it's a loud sound. So what I'll do is go through and make everything a consistent level. So then when I go to mix, I can just pull volumes up and down as I need without running out of room to do it or I'm having to have it running so low that I have very little control over it. So just balancing all the volumes uh, individually on their own. Very good. We're getting through it here. So the next thing I'll do is mixing, but I always like all my editing done before I start mixing. I don't like to start playing with frequencies and volumes um, in a balanced perspective before I've got everything edited. I like editing it and then I'll get all those tracks out and I'll pull them into a fresh mix window so the tracks don't have cuts all through them and, and markings and whatever. It's just like a neat okay, this is the song. These are the tracks I'm going to mix. I found that really helps me. But as so I get all my tracking done, I get all my editing done, and then I can just approach the mix um, with my mix brain. I think when during editing, it's kind of quite logical. You're thinking this works, that works, this works. When you get to mix, it's like this feels, that feels. So you kind of want to be totally creative there, which means all of the logical stuff is done and you can just be creative. So within that, I've got a mix template, which will already have my effects and everything set up and ready to go so that I'm not switching to my logical brain and figuring out, okay, now that needs to be routed to there, and then this reverb comes through here. It's just all good to go, so I can just feel it and make it sound good creatively. So during my mix, I'm really just trying to get balance. I think that is what mixing is. It's just balancing the tracks. So there's two things that we're balancing. The first is volume and the second is frequency. So balancing volume is is just moving the faders up and down, moving the, the loudness of the track so that it sounds good. So if you've got a rock track, you want the kick drum and the snare nice and loud. You want the vocals nice and loud. You want the guitars kind of sitting just off that. You want the bass in underneath. So just getting volume. So the first thing I'll do is go through and get the volume sounding balanced across all of the tracks. So all my faders are up um, and there's just a nice balance. So from there, it kind of sounds relatively mixed. Volume is like, volume is your biggest tool in the mix. So I just get it all balanced volume wise, and then I'll start to balance the frequencies. So that means that's talking about like um, bass, low mids, high mids, trebles. Um, you you would have played with those controls in your car or on your TV stereo or something where you can kind of manipulate the frequency. 
So I want to make sure that there's not a build up of frequency. So we haven't got too much bass in the track. We haven't got too much mids in the track. So maybe like if you've got your kick drum and your bass guitar, they're both kind of doing the same frequency. So maybe I'll decide, all right, let's take some bass out of the kick drum. So all the bottom ends coming from the bass and then we can make the kick drum a bit more attacky. Or maybe you want that really dance sort of kick. So you might take a little bit out of the bass, a little bit of bass out of the bass and put a bit more, it gets confusing bit of bottom end out of the bass um, so you can make your kick have all your bottom end but if you had both of those just pumping bottom end you have a really unbalanced track it'll be too bassy um, same up in the upper mid so you've got guitar tones very similar frequency to a vocal so you've got to pick which one of those you want to occupy that space and then you shape the other one around it so that's just using eq curves where you can just pull out certain frequencies and this is where you really get the tone of your recording. So once you've got a, once I've, I've found, once I've got it balanced volume wise, you can hear pretty quickly, okay, that's everything sounds at the right volume, but it's too muddy or it's too bright or it's too harsh or um, there's not enough body in it or something like that. And that's when you can start to adjust instruments, e equalization, instruments, EQ, frequency to get that balance back um, not just in volume now, but in frequency and in tonal balance. So that when you hear it, it's got a good amount of um, highs. There's a nice crisp high. It's got those deep lows and the mids are just balanced and sitting where they should be. So if you've ever heard a boomy mix or a thin mix or a dull mix or a bright mix, then they've got the frequencies out of balance. So we're trying to get balanced volume and then frequency. After that, I'm trying to achieve dynamics. So this is just making sure that the song moves in and out. It's not just this big solid block of um, sound. So that's where you're going to start using compression. So maybe if you got like, you use that on drums a lot, where you've got big transients from the kick and the snare, you might just compress those a bit just to kind of bring them down in volume on the actual hits. And that will give you a bit more room for the rest of the track to kind of come through. You might do that on vocals as well to catch your T's and your S's or something that has like a big amount of air coming out. You might just compress those, which gives a bit more volume and body to your quieter sounds that you're singing. Um, same with guitars and anything. So you're kind of grabbing dynamics there. And at this point, I'll also start pulling volumes in and out of different instruments. So if you want to make your verse quieter than your chorus, then yeah, that's dynamics. That's where it shifts in volume. So you want to actually be turning down the volumes during the verses or maybe deleting a double guitar. You just got a single guitar during the verse and the double guitar comes back into the chorus. So anything that I can do within the track to just control dynamics and make sure that there's a journey happening with the mix. So I've got balance. Now I want to make sure I've got dynamics because those two will work together to tell the story. After that, I want to be adding space back in. So uh, this might be adding reverbs or delays or something to give that sense of uh, atmosphere and space. So particularly on a vocal or a drum kit, you want to be adding a little bit of reverb and there's a bunch of different reverbs you can use depending on what you want to do. But this will just kind of add a bit of space and life back into the track. Often when you're recording the studio, you've kind of got a really controlled sound but sometimes just adding a bit of space gives it that, makes it a bit more natural and a bit more how we expect to hear sounds. After I've got that, I've got a really balanced track. I've got a dynamic track. I've given it some life and space with some effects or with some reverbs rather. Now I'm going to give it any effects that it needs. So if you want that, I know like a rise up into your chorus, there's a big build, or if you're using flanges or, you know, just effects, something that sounds, gives it a bit of character. I might add that at this stage. And now we've got a mix that's ready to be mastered. So at this point, I'm going to send that out to the artist to make sure they're happy with it. And, and we always tweak stuff from there. So the artist will always say, oh, can my vocals be a bit louder in the pre-chorus? Or I think that the kick drum sounds a bit too dull. Can we give that a bit more punch? Or um, the guitar sound a bit scratchy. Can we do something about that? So we'll then go through and adjust tone. Because at this point, it's really just my me trying to uh, achieve the vision that we worked out in pre-production, which kind of got to put a few heads together and make sure that what the artist wants is coming through in the mix. So there'll always be adjustments to make and that's totally fine. Um, I expect that and I want that. I want the artist to be happy with it. So there's usually a bit of mucking around at this point, just fixing up some different tones, getting it to sit where they wanted it to sit. And then we can pump out the mix and get that ready for mastering. Mastering is something that nobody really knows what it is, or that's probably the greyest area in the whole process. And mastering is really just preparing it for release. 
So it's like putting the coat of varnish on the table. It's kind of getting it ready to use. It's kind of, yeah, doing that. How many different ways can I say the same thing? So for that, I am just giving it a bit more oomph and giving it a bit of saturation and body. Um, so I'm going to put some like tube emulators on or some tape emulators or something to give it a bit more roundness and body. Um, I'm going to EQ it if it needs it. So if it's a good mix, it should be sitting well. But just say it's a little out of balance, it sounds a little bit bright, um, I can just pull a bit of um, highs out. So when we're mixing, we're working with a bunch of tracks. So you've got kick, snare, hi-hat, vocal. When you're mastering, you've got one track. So it's all now just in one thing. So if I turn trebles down, if I turn the highs down, it's going to affect everything that has highs in it. Whereas if I turn the highs down just on the vocal, it's only going to affect the vocal. The symbols will be just as bright. In the mastering stage, if we pull down highs, it's going to pull it across the whole track. So you've got to be kind of careful with that. But it is a good opportunity to just, yeah, let's just make it a bit brighter. Let's give it a bit more kick. Let's give it a bit more sub. So everything that's in the sub region can now come up a bit. Just kind of get that balance and punch. And really what we're doing is making it comparable to the market. So if you're an acoustic pop, I'm going to be listening to a bunch of acoustic pop songs that sound really great and using that as a reference. So how much bottom end is in their mix, how much brightness is in their mix. And I can kind of shape this mask, this mix track now to kind of sit with that. You want it to sit in a playlist or a, a compilation album and sound like it's in the same ballpark as these other mixes. So that's tonal with these highs and lows, but it's also volume. So once you get a mix, it really doesn't matter how loud the overall mix is. But by the end of mastering, you want that to be as loud as everything else that's out there so that like I said, it can come on in a mix. Um, it can sit in your album and fit. It sounds like the song before it and the song after it sounds like it as well. So leveling and kind of getting it ready for the market is really what it's about. So you'll do that with um, compression. You'll limit the peaks. So if those snares are coming through too hard and they're peaking, you limiting is going to kind of squash those down a little bit. It still sounds very, very similar if you're doing it right. Um, so you've got like, you've taken away all your peaks and that way you can just turn the whole thing up and have it sitting and sound quite big and powerful and lush. So it's like a polish, it's like a varnish, it's just kind of that finishing touch, but really what it's doing is preparing it for the real world. It's preparing it to be competitive alongside other mixes. And it's also, the last thing it's doing when you're getting it out is formatting it. So it's, it's making it in the right format for um, to go to CD or the right format to upload to your Spotify and that sort of thing. So just making it ready, making it ready to release is pretty much what mastering is. So that is my recording process. I hope that was helpful for you. I hope you got some insight, maybe learned something new um, about the recordings process. Why don't you chuck in the comments something that you didn't know about? What's the step of this whole process that you didn't know about? Or if I touched on something you went, I want to know more about that, please ask me a question. I'd love to help you with that. I'd love to go a bit deeper into any of these topics and kind of uh, just help you out with that. So I think the whole the whole purpose of this, just give you an idea. Like I said, artists have really appreciated when I write this all down for them and show them where we're going. So hopefully if you're thinking about recording, this has helped you out and maybe given you a bit of confidence about it. You don't need to have all the answers. Let your studio producer have all the answers. Let them worry about making it sound big and making it sound full. You just have to turn up and play your song and they'll do that for you. I'm just doing short episodes every week, 15 to 20 minutes, talking about this very thing, going from musician to artist. So we cover topics about branding, uh, playing live, songwriting, recording, and promotion, all to uh, just help you go from musician to artist, help you do music for a living, to get paid for it, to get out of the job that you don't want, and to follow your passion, which is music. So subscribe to the channel to keep up to date with that. It's here on YouTube. It's also on your favorite podcast app as well. So uh, go and check that out. Thank you so much. Uh, make some music this week and we'll talk again soon.